so I, I really appreciate you doing the bios, uh, Sue Allen. Um, because, you know, we're all here because we love books, um, I'm assuming. Um, uh, I certainly do. Books bring so much joy, but they also, at least for me, bring a lot of anxiety because I've got stacks and stacks of them, right? <laughs> And you want to be reading the next one while you're reading the current one. So I'm currently reading three books. They are Morgenthau, These Are the Plunderers, and Hang the Moon. <laughs> that's actually true. I, I got this gig last week, and that's 2,000 that's 2, pages. And I was already reading three books. Um, so those are gathering dust. Well, uh, And I got deep enough into all of them to be like, oh, my God, of course, these are amazing books. They're all amazing books, right? Um, you'll never get through them all, but we can at least hear about all three of these. And when I was emailing with Jeanette, she's like, do you think anyone is going to understand why I'm on this panel? Um, and I got far enough into Hang the Moon to, uh, to, to realize what she said was true, that it's is a story of dynastic power and wealth in the United States um, on a smaller scale, yeah. um, but with the same dynamics. Um, and uh, those dynamics, you know, reach all the way to the, you know, to the halls of power in Washington and New York in, in, in certain ways. So we'll get into that. But instead of me, you know, summarizing all the work, I want you to, I want all of you to do that. Um, just, you know, what, at, a, at a Martha's Vineyard cocktail party, when someone asks you, what's your book about? Um, don't bore them with a 10 minute answer, but what's your you know, potted history of the book? Let's start with you. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, thank you all, the organizers. Um, first of all, can you hear us up here? Um, I can't believe that you would have this many people uh, coming out in August uh, to listen to um, authors, so thank you for doing that. It, it restores my faith. Um, um, it's a long book, The Morgan Does, uh, and I think I would say very simply, um, what other family in American history across 150 years through four generations has been up and down and up again, but at the highest levels of um, public uh, service? and. It's a really hard question for me to answer. Um, someone will throw out the Adams family. Um, <laughs> there are some, certainly some German Jewish uh, dynasties who would uh, compete, but I don't think that they compare. And it's really about the long arc of history in America told through one family. Um, I don't know if that will win me plaudits at a cocktail party, but. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a ripping tale. Gretchen. So, a book about private equity sounds really boring, <laughs> right? Your eyes glaze over. Um, but private equity is a real force in this country and one that I think people need to understand better. Um, these are folks that we used to call corporate raiders, uh, leveraged buyout artists, and they took on this new sort of sanitized name. And I think examining what they have done over the past 30 or so years to um, entrench themselves, enrich themselves, at the expense of quite a few people is a really important story to tell. It's not always obvious. These are secretive uh, entities. They're companies that are um, often private. They are often run by uh, men, mostly white men, who are um, lionized in the press. And so you don't have people raising their hands and saying, what really are you doing here to the vast number of people? The workers in the companies you take over. The pensioners in the companies that you take over. The customers of the companies that you take over. The circle of pain that is associated with this industry is large, and yet the beneficiaries are a very small group of elite people, and that's what I'm trying to expose. Jeanette. Oh, bear with me while I tell you a real quick story about, about um, touring with the Glass Castle. And I've been lucky enough that the, my memoir has been read in a number of schools, and a teacher told me that she gave the book to a young woman who's had a few brushes with the law. She said she's a good girl, but she she's kind of works outside the law, and she thought that my, my book would help her 
figure some things out. And this young woman came to the class and slammed the book down. And she said, that is a very upsetting book to me. And the teacher said, why is that? And this young woman says, there's a scene where the mother takes three children to go shoplifting for one of the kids. And that is just wrong. And the teacher thinks, oh, this is great. I can have a conversation with this young woman about crime and punishment and all those good topics. And the teacher said, well, what upset you about that? And this young woman says, when you go shoplifting for one of the kids, you got to get something for all of them. <laughs> the teacher said, we had quite the eye-opening conversation. <laughs> she said, I'd always thought of this young woman as a rule breaker. But after that conversation, I realized she wasn't a rule breaker at all. She just followed a different set of rules. Mm. And that became fat. That really kind of stuck with me. Uh, people who follow a different set of rules. So, so Hang the Moon is about a, a woman in the, during Prohibition who runs a moonshining uh, ring. And she's very, she follows her rules, but breaks everybody else's. Yeah. And it's a, mm. Wonderful so far. I want to dig into each of the, the topics and the, the ideas in each of your books. So um, I'm going to sort of do a a number of questions for each of you. I was trying to figure out how to get everybody in on the same question, and it was challenging. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to start with Gretchen, um, who, late breaking flash, the book industry is about to be taken over by KKR. Um, My publisher, in particular. Your Simon & Schuster um, is uh, now going to be taken over. So, you know, no irony there. Um, I got in right under the wire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but your book is, is eviscerating. Uh, you know, it sort of takes no prisoners. Um, factual. <laughs> factual as well, yes. Uh, it is journalism, um, which I'm a big believer in. Um, can you sort of unpack how private equity widens uh, inequality? So, as I said a moment ago, it's um, an industry that has been gaining in prominence and uh, prevalence since the late 1980s when we um, first encountered these people in the RJR Nabisco deal, which was quite illuminating and eye-opening, and it was the subject of an amazing book called The Barbarians at the Gate. Um, the barbarians are no longer at the gate. <laughs> They're at the controls of the economy. And so that's what I really want to help people to understand. Um, they don't advertise that they are at the controls. They don't want necessarily people to know that they're at the controls, but they are. So they take over companies. Traditionally, they fire many employees. One study showed that after a takeover by a leveraged private equity firm, 13% of the employees were cut from their positions. Um, these companies use very heavy levels, heavy levels of debt, which they put onto the company they're buying, and then they extract assets from those companies. So this is an extraction industry, like ExxonMobil, for example. It extracts wealth from the people who operate, who are in the industry, from the customers of the industry, pensioners, etc. So it's it's really a this is this is an entity and an industry that has been growing over these decades and unfettered, really. Um, and allowed to take over many, many companies, do damage, extract the wealth from them. And if they happen to go bankrupt, many, many cases of private equity-owned companies do go bankrupt. Another academic study had 10 times the number of companies going bankrupt that were acquired versus those acquired by non-private equity buyers. So. And you see this in certain areas. Healthcare is a huge area of interest. So the firms find big pools of money, big pools of um, opportunity for them to buy. And then they basically extract wealth from the workers, the customers, and the, all of the other participants involved. One quick story from the book, it really sort of exemplifies this. It was a, an aluminum smelter in, um, Madrid, in New Madrid, Missouri, which is in the Boot Hill region of the state. And Apollo Global Management, run by Leon Black, took it over. 
They extracted cash and assets out of it. They fired people over the course of years, of course. They then increased the rates for all the other states, all the other um, rate payers in Missouri had to pay higher rates on their electricity because the smelter was able to get a special deal from the regulators. They, when it went bankrupt, they let the school children and teachers of the town down because they were not paying their taxes when the company went bankrupt. And so the school children went without books and the teachers went without health insurance. Um, so you see the sort of broad impact in that particular case. When they bankrupted the company, 2,500 workers were out of a job. It was the crucial employer in the city. So this is an example of what they do. Not all of them, not all of them, but many of the largest, most prestigious and powerful firms are in this business. Um, I, I feel, because I have friends in private equity, <laughs> that I need to at least ask on their behalf, what's, <laughs> what, when I talk to them, they say that they're doing good. Um, and they're fixing broken companies, they're increasing shareholder returns. Um, do you buy that? Um, they've said that for a long time, and in the beginning, John, they probably were making companies more efficient. Uh, when they set out in the 80s, there was a big disparity between undervalued assets, the value of the assets in the stock market, and the value of the assets of these companies, but that's no longer the case. So what I would answer to that is their uh, creation of efficiencies in these companies are often what creates the damage and the pain mm -hmm. to everybody else. So, okay, what cost is the efficiency exacting on people? Efficiency is nice, but is efficiency, for example, the reason why the Blackstone-owned slaughterhouse cleaning company hired 13-year-olds to clean the floors of their slaughterhouses? Mm -hmm. It might be more efficient, to hire 13-year-olds to clean the floors of the slaughterhouses, but is that really what you want to do? Right. So I think the efficiency argument t does not take into effect this circle of pain that I right. talk about. Yeah. And it also is sort of on steroids, this idea that only the, if you serve the stockholders, then you're fine yes. and you're doing well, your job. Well, that is the religion of U U.S. capitalism, isn't it? That's Serve right. the stockholder. Serve above the stockholder. All. So let's start to think about all the other stakeholders right. in the process. So I have one follow up for you because there's no way I'm defending the PE industry from that. Um, uh, did you get, um, you know, did you have any hope in doing the reporting that there is something to be done about this, that there's any energy behind um, maybe creating? Uh, federal uh, level regulations that might address these kinds of practices? Well, um, th uh, this has been allowed to go on for 30 years, and mostly it has been under the radar. It's been very stealth. Um, uh, DOJ has not really brought that many antitrust cases, even though these companies now control 40%. Um, they run and operate 40% of the nation's emergency departments. So uh, they've been able to kind of acquire a lot of companies under the radar because they're small, but once they roll all of them up, they become very, very strong and powerful market forces. And so I think we could have a more aggressive DOJ going after anti on these on antitrust issues. We could have uh, pensions are an enormous uh, source of oxygen for these people. Public pensions like CalPERS, CalSTRS, they're the ones who keep these people in business. And I do not understand how they can do so given the um, amount of damage that yeah. some of these firms do. So I think we would, uh, I would love to see pensions questioning that. We now see that private equity does not have the um, uh, better returns that they used to. And so maybe that'll c cause some sort of discussion about it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, all right, we're going to come back to, to that idea because I think that ladders directly to political power, right? Um, but before, let's go to Jeanette. Um, I want to understand the inspiration for the book because that really does circle back yeah. to power and dynasty. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had long been fascinated by Queen Elizabeth I. My, yeah. um, 
my mother and father used to have these screaming fights over them. My, my mother hated Elizabeth, thought that she reminded her of her own mother. Just like, <laughs> she was pushy. She always had to have her but own just way. Just for the benefit of people like me who might be in the audience, I don't really have a character sketch of Elizabeth I in my head. Can you help me out? Uh, she, uh, 1500, she became um, the queen of, um, of England against all odds. Against all odds. She was, uh, her mother, she was born in great scandal and was not expected to inherit the, ro the throne because there were so many people ahead of her. And there was great pressure on her to marry so that a man could do the man's business of running a country. Mm. And um, my father admired her hugely, said she was a tough old broad who did what needed to be done. And of course they were both right. Um, but um, I was reading a biography of Elizabeth the first one time and they were shooting each other and marrying cousins and feuding all over the place and I was thinking, these are just like white trash. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, hey, wait a minute. What if you took this basic story and moved it up to prohibition? And I, one of the reasons this book, I didn't spend as long as Andrew did on his book, but I'm I, close to, he has the excuse if he had actual facts to check. But, um, <laughs> but I just, I went down so many rabbit holes on this, but um, I, I kind of paired up the prohibition, the, um, the, the dries versus the wets with the Catholics versus the Protestants that was going on during the period. But mm -hmm. um, um, it's funny because some people who've read Hang the Moon thought that it was inspired by succession. Hmm. Right. Um, and other people have thought yeah. it was inspired by the Trumps. So it, you know, it's a, it, this whole issue of dynasty is, is very timeless. Right. It's not modern, it's not ancient, it's timeless. But I was fascinated by a woman who, heading up a dynasty, which we don't see a lot right. of. Right. And um, the, the cost you pay, the prices you pay for that. Yeah, well, and, and she didn't exactly inherit it, right? I mean, she was the daughter, right? but she had to fight for it. Well, right, as did Elizabeth. I mean, yeah. you, know, I, you know, wherever there's a power vacuum, one has to fight, and it was not expected that, that Sally or, or Elizabeth would would rise to the occasion. And that was why that my father and, and I had such great respect. And I, th I, I think it's, a, like I said, an interesting and important story to, you know, I, I love history. I love, you know, going back. And I, it's, almost like, it's almost like therapy uh, for a nation because you don't understand where you are until you go back and look at where you've been. Yes. And Prohibition was so interesting for me. I thought I'd kind of fall in love with the 20s. Um, but I had the opposite effect. It was, I, you know, and, and I'd emerge from, from reading about the 20s and read these newspapers where people say, it's never been so divisive and America's never been so horrible. It's like, you know something? Uh, it was pretty bad back in the 20s. So, I, you know, I think, that the, I think the cure for nostalgia is research. You know, and, and you go back and you read these things and it's like, oh my God. So I'm not saying everything is perfect, but, um, uh, but I, I do think that there's been a lot of progress. But we have to study these things we've been through. So we stop making the same darn mistakes over and over again. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. That's a great line, which I, I, I'll cite you, but I'm using that line. <laughs> um, and, and, and it brings a question to mind uh, about research. I uh -huh. think there's an assumption. Yeah. You know, three of us written nonfiction books, yeah, and there's yeah. a lot of research involved in that. Um, yeah, yeah. Tell me about how you research a novel. Oh, yeah. So I thought, well, this is great. It's, it's fiction. I can make it all up, right? <laughs> and it's almost the opposite. I think when you have nonfiction, you don't have to keep on, you don't have to ask yourself, could this happen? Because it did happen. And um, you don't have to ask yourself, well, what would this character do in this situation? And being the nerd that I am coming from journalism and, and nonfiction books, I, I base it very heavily on fact, not just on Elizabeth, but on, there was a, um, uh, there was a, a trial in Virginia after Prohibition had been lifted, and there was a county in Virginia, Franklin County, uh, that was called the wettest spot in, in the world in America. And um, it was estimated that 99% of the residents of Franklin County were involved in moonshining in one <laughs> capacity or another. And so I used that kind of as a template for how the business operated. Right. And, you know, the, the, the sheriff and, and the, the town leaders were all deeply involved. Yeah. And, I, you know, I went down so every time I researched something fascinating research on on 
the history of flypaper. Fortunately for readers, my editor didn't find it fascinating. <laughs> but anybody who wants to know, come up and talk to me, honey. I can tell you all about flypaper. So every time I'd put even a phrase, you know, like um, a phrase that sounded old-fashioned to me, like gussied up, 1930s, I couldn't use it. A lot of slang comes from the 20s. So, mm. so yeah, you know, I, yeah. I found that I had to actually research it more, I felt, than, than nonfiction. There are many scenes where, I, I don't know, would you consider um, uh, the patriarch, Duke, um, an antagonist or? Uh, I guess, yeah. I yeah. Guess, yeah, yeah. Where, where, uh-huh. where he meets out this sort of, you know, non-governmental justice. Right, right. right. And then there's a great scene after, um, I don't want to give away anything. Anyways, mm-hmm. after he exits the picture, it's it's hard um, to talk about this book and not give spoilers. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. where where basically they're just meeting out all the spoils of the of right. the of the business, right. um, with absolutely no input from anybody else. And I'm curious, do you think that Duke Kincaid, who was kind of the scion of the family, uh-huh. um, was a plunderer? Absolutely, <laughs> no question. He didn't have LBOs and and and, sh- and stockholders, but yeah, yeah. It was you know he was somebody who just exploited what was out there and enriched himself. And the great irony to me, and again, this is largely based on historical characters, is that it was also beloved and admired. Right. And I guess it's one of the reasons people think that he's based on, on Trump, is because it, so often these larger-than-life, sort of uh, narcissistic, uh, patriarchal characters also are very beloved. And I was trying to sort of capture that, that, like, that dichotomy, that fascinating yeah. thing that yeah. happens when somebody takes over a community and is loved and respected for right. it. And feared. Feared. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of characters like that, let's go to Andrew. Um, the Morgenthau is uh, really fascinating. You, 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 in your introduction, gave a little bit of a portrait of why you found them fascinating, but I want you to unpack that a bit. Well, first of all, I don't know why uh, uh, you think this panel doesn't hang together. Um, <laughs> we've got... It was you know, a straw man, Andrew. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Prohibition was actually one of my favorite chapters. There oh, were many that yeah, got cut. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, yeah. those of you probably know this who know a little bit of the, the history of Henry Morgan Dodd Jr., who was the longest-serving uh, Treasury Secretary in U.S. history, he got uh, booted from boarding school. He got booted from college twice. But he was very, very effective at getting FDR's bootleg liquor during yeah. Prohibition. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going up to Canada and in Alabama and in Georgia. Um, so that's Prohibition. Yeah. And, of course, everything Gretchen said, uh, much of that is not only in the book, uh, but I think that I never called him the boss, um, but many of you probably who knew him, um, called him the boss, uh, Robert Morgenthau, the longest DA in um, uh, the history of New York County, uh, is, uh, I don't know what the c- correct verb is, but rejoicing, I think, would come close t- for everything Gretchen said. So, um, I mean, I, I wrote a thousand-page book, so I should be able to cover those two. Uh, <laughs> uh, the inspiration um, was very much about looking at, again, history and the lessons to learn from it. And I first approached Robert Morgenthau um, in the spring of 2008. I cannot tell a lie. Uh, He was 89 years old um, in the DA's office, one of the biggest offices in lower Manhattan, or probably anywhere in Manhattan. Um, And I went on a roost uh, that I was going to do a magazine profile um, for the Times Magazine. And he wasn't really interested in another magazine profile. Um, But I had read his um, uh, great-grandfather's, it's not really a diary, it's called a Lebensgeschichte, a life history, that he wrote at the old age of 24 um, in uh, um, 1842, and that was Lazarus Morgenthau, and he's the patriarch who comes. And he was loved and feared, feared mostly by his own family. Uh, Jeanette, I think you would find a couple of crazy father scenes um, (laughs) in, I'm referencing um, the first book, um, in Lazarus Morgenthau. And that's really, long story short, a rags to riches to rags story, which is unusual, of course, in the American immigration story. Lazarus Morgenthau um, uh, came from a large Orthodox family in Germany, uh, was a serial inventor, something of a con man, a hustler, 
again, there's a little, I was researching uh, the mid 18th, 19th century and thinking about Donald Trump, um, as we all were then, yeah, and, yeah. and now. Um, and he comes to America having lost everything. He right. had been a cigar baron, um, very unusually. He had um, three factories, a thousand people, many of them no doubt about 13 years old, working for him in Germany. Um, in the 1860s, tariff laws, Lincoln comes to America basically stony broke and has to reinvent himself, and he can't. So he spends 30 years in New York, speaking German, praying to a certain extent um, on uh, rich, um, uh, elderly German-Jewish widows, um, which is probably uh, too strong a description. Um, founds charities, some quite dubious. The law catches up with him. He dies alone and, and poor, uh, estranged from his family, and most of all, his long-suffering wife, Babette, 14 children, 23 years. Um, talk about a circle of pain. Um, <laughs> and not to, be, not to be too flippant. Um, but out of that comes Henry Morgenthau Sr. And he really is an American, um, uh, a child of Ben Franklin, Emerson, not the German Jewish orthodoxy that his father had left behind. And he's also a child of that ruin, that financial ruin. So Henry Morgenthau Sr., again, it's uh, John, John will get there, but not by the end of this weekend, um, uh, becomes really the first real estate bundler, um, a syndicate um, master, and develops most of lower Manhattan, Wall Street, the great citadels of Wall Street. He helped build. Um, they pass through his hands, the plaza, most of um, uh, northern Manhattan, the Bronx, the brownstones, and in in, even in the South Bronx that are still standing. Every once in a while, the Times runs a story on where do these things come from, these beautiful brownstones, which have been maintained. That's the work of Henry Morgenthau Sr. He believed in privilege um, as doing public service. I write that it's really that, but it's also about joining the political class. You make money, but then you give back, and you join the political class. And that's really the beginning of sort of the, the, the political dynasty of the Morgenthaus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's so much more. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But I wanted to unpack, uh, this was a great question that you sent me, um, the subtitle, because it has sort of three key words in it, power, privilege, and the rise of an American family. In the family that you researched, were any of those words more important than any others? Power, privilege, family. Well, uh, I, I was discussing it with someone, a reader, uh, before we came up. Um, you know, each of those words is pretty loaded. <laughs> uh, and power, um, uh, I kind of had to use, and that was actually um, Robert Caro um, urging me. He also urged me to, you know, uh, go for broke. You've got three volumes here. And I said, no, <laughs> I want to try to preserve, preserve a marriage. And the kids were getting, you know, bigger and bigger each year. Um, and so power was uh, inevitable. And anyone who met the DA felt the power. Um, and it's a very uh, difficult thing to describe, um, but you can feel it. And Privilege, of course, is a trigger word, as was said to me today. Um, and I really struggled with that uh, for a long time. Um, and the epigraph to the book is about that. It's Henry Sr. who becomes the real estate magnate and then the American ambassador uh, to Constantinople, witnesses the Armenian genocide. Um, in Turkey, political bundler for Woodrow Wilson, re-elex Wilson, he says to the future DA, I had to wait until I was 55 to enter public service. You don't, and that's a privilege. So the idea is mm -hmm. to return privilege, still a, it still of course is a, is a, a, a word um, that we wrestle with and we must wrestle with, but the DA, even though he and Mike Bloomberg would spar about offshore, just to, just to pick on one person, um, and private equity, and he pretty much wrote the, bank, uh, the Banking Act, um, Robert Morgenthau did. He had wealth, he had means, yeah. um, but it was always about serving some, it sounds corny, it sounds cliched, it was always about serving something higher than himself. Yeah. And that's actually one of the main themes that runs throughout uh, the four generations. Yeah, 
Um, and and it, it opens the door to a question, which I'm going to put a pin in, because I want to ask you one more specific to your work. Um, and you mentioned Caro, probably the greatest biographer ever. I mean, sorry, Andrew. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> That's no, 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 not no. fair of me to say. No one stands on Robert I've got Carol's. one of his books sitting, you know, staring at me, making me feel <laughs> we, guilty. We don't say, uh, someone um, said you stand on his shoulders. No, we stand in his shadow. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Um, but I want you to, to sort of tell us a bit about your challenges as a biographer. Did you have a challenge of access, uh, material, like process? You know, what were the obstacles? What were the, you know, aha moments? Yeah, the great, I mean, Jeanette and I were talking about this before. It's always the, it's always the pre-panel talk that's always the best. <laughs> yeah, always. As you guys know. Um, and you were, we were talking about the difference between writing fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how you get closer to the truth. And I have a friend who's done both. And she says, it's the inconvenience of fact. And that's really the challenge, is how do you deal with the inconvenience of fact? You try to get as close to the truth as possible. And... You know, if, uh, if somebody writes it was uh, snowing in Mobile, Alabama in 1963, uh, and it, two paragraphs later, it was a, a, a warm day in August, you sort of scratch your head. Um, and that's where it's easy. Where it's difficult is when you have millions and millions and millions of pages of documents and family archives. But I first thing I did when I took this on... Um, and I knew very little about the 19th century generation, um, half of which is also the Lehman family. Um, any Lehman, Lehmans in the audience, excuse me, I could only fit the Morgenthaus on the title. Um, <laughs> but one branch of the family, of course, is the Lehman family. And millions of pages of documents, uh, you have to learn to subtract. You have to, you, and I'm kind of obsessive. Uh, so that's the guy who wrote a thousand-page book. Yeah, well, it was it was more than a decade. Um, yeah. A friend is a psychologist, and I said, yeah, I was sort of midstream. I said, there's probably a syndrome, um, you know, for this. She said, oh, there's several. Um, <laughs> and so you're in the archives, and of course, it's, things are getting more digitized and digitized all the time. Um, says, I don't need to tell one of the co-founders of Wired Magazine. <laughs> if there were no internets, this book would have been done in half the time. Um, and I really feel that it would have been a lot, uh, a lot poorer for it. Right. Um, but it was really trying to find the main themes, which I hope I succeeded, and then cutting, cutting, cutting. Um, uh, five main cases from 35 years as District Attorney of New York. Each had to be illustrative, each had to be different, each had to be innovative that really showed Morgenthau not just um, prosecuting, but making law. And, and then you go see really smart people. Yeah. I went to go see Sonia Sotomayor, um, just one of probably more than 80 former assistants who've gone on to the bench. And um, Justice Sotomayor said, oh, no, you've got to do this case. Not, not one of hers. So you've got to do this case, and you've got to do that case, and you've got to do this case. And occasionally I would say, if you had to pick five yeah. from 35 years, and actually I do 10 years when he was the chief uh, federal prosecutor in uh, Manhattan, the Southern District, what would the five be? And I would ask... I don't know, maybe 10 people, they all said the same five. Well, there you go. Yeah, no. so that, that no. I was lucky, yeah. No. Well, now I have to ask, can you just tell us a couple of them? Which <laughs> five? Uh, so uh, one actually, um, uh, because uh, I am at heart an investigative reporter and I do try to find things that need um, greater light, greater attention, uh, the Washington Square riot case of 1976, um, it, uh, I was very, very lucky that the New York Times excerpted uh, an enormous, I think it was two pages in, in print, or maybe longer, an enormous excerpt from the book. Uh, so you don't have to read um, whatever it is, 10, 15,000 words over several chapters. It was almost a completely forgotten case. Almost completely forgotten case. I also do the Central Park Jogger case, mm -hmm. uh, in which, of course, there were many attacks that night, and a severe attack on uh, the jogger uh, herself, Trisha Miley. Um, but that night, no one died. It's not to take away anything from the acts that happened that night and the victims. Mm -hmm. But in Washington Square, a young man did die. And his name is Marcus Mota. And um, our kids were going to middle school uh, in Brooklyn. And Marcus Mota's uh, mother, single mom from the Dominican Republic, lived across the street by pure coincidence. 
And I spent 10 years in Russia. I know that you know people don't move much. Well, it's the same in Brooklyn. So I rang the buzzer, and a cousin was living in that apartment. And, um, and Marcus Mota's mother was, had gone back to the Dominican Republic. It's almost an entirely forgotten case, which is in itself a great New York opera, yeah. a great in the sense of an amazing story um, about race, about drugs, uh, about the police and police uh, complicity, co and also about Morgenthau doing the right thing um, and balancing all the mayhem and the madness that also take front and center in the Jogger case and in the other case, uh, one other I'll just angle, um, BCCI, uh, that the director of the CIA called the Bank of Crooks and Criminals. Um, <laughs> So, but that's really the case that I, th I think I enjoyed investigating the most. Um, it also helped that I went to the archives and instead of, you know, the Roosevelt Library, which was fantastic, and the Library of Congress, when you're going through archives and looking through, this is, uh, Jeanette probably knows, and Gretchen certainly knows it, this is the microfilm reel, um, <laughs> which many libraries, many archives still, still are pre-digital. Pre um, I went down to the municipal archives, my favorite building, biggest secret I'll reveal today in Lower Manhattan. Beautiful. And a gorgeous building. Mm -hmm. And they wheeled out, I asked them for this case, they wheeled out 88 oh. boxes, including grand jury testimony. Oh, wow. So that was the other reason why I enjoyed it. That must be fun. Wow. There's some grand jury testimony I'd love to see right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, a question for all of you, uh, and then please, you guys get your questions ready because we want a lot of robust uh, interaction uh, with, with the readers. Um, at the root of everything we've been discussing, I think you could say particularly a very sort of American root is, is money, just money, right? Um, money seems to be, uh, you know, it takes on characteristics. Andrew and you were discussing um, um, the boss. It's like, well, that privilege of having money, the privilege of coming from money, un understanding how money works, allows for sort of good money, right? People to do good. But Gretchen, I think it could be argued that there might also be bad money or bad <laughs> behavior enabled by money or where the strictures of how money is made sort of just output bad things, right? Um, and money is certainly at the center, Jeanette, of not, not only this work, but, but certainly other, you know, other works of yours. Mm -hmm. um, so what is it mm -hmm. in your study of, uh, uh, and, and your work, what is it about America and money? Great question. Should I go first? Yeah, please. Um, um, well, I mean, one of the great things about having told my story is that people feel safe coming up and telling me their stories. And sometimes they have shockingly similar backgrounds to mine, but sometimes they come from great wealth. And I was never so stupid that I didn't realize that rich people got problems as well. But it's just been so interesting to hear people unburdening themselves. And that was one of the reasons that I wanted to write about wealth, because it's exactly what you said. You know, this money, it's a tool, okay? It's a tool. You can do whatever you want with it. But it also has this incredible power of, of both good and evil. And what do you do with that? Um, you know, and, and personally, my own journey, having gone from like, you know, growing up without indoor plumbing, I got four flush toilets now, honey. I tell you, <laughs> life is good. Push the little handle, it all disappears. So I'm, I'm all for money. But, um, <laughs> but my character, Sally, born into wealth, but since she was ostracized for a little while, booted out and then comes back. So that's kind of the issue she's grappling with is, you know, can you be, how, how can you be wealthy and still be good? How, what is generosity? What, what, how do you spread it around? How are you generous? Can you have power and, and, and can you be wealthy? Should you spread it equally? And I will say I'll completely wuss out of this one because I, I don't have the answer as a, as a novelist. I just ask the questions. Right. And it's, it's something, it is at the central, at the center of, of my main character's dilemma. How do you be a good person and also be a tough ass and run this, com this, this community mm -hmm. and, and kick the, the 
people in the behind who you don't like what they're doing. So, so I think it, I think it's an ongoing discussion, and I think that that's why it's so beautiful that you all are here, just having this conversation with us, because we have to have this conversation. And you know, uh, you know, one of the great things that money does is it brought you all here today to listen to this. I mean, that's it's so, so it's good, but it can also be, you know, as Gretchen has pointed out, like it can be very devious, and sometimes the deviousness can be shielded with with like phony charities and stuff like that. So we just all have to be vigilant and, and remember the power of storytelling, truthful storytelling, behind, you know, behind the facade storytelling about what's really going on mm -hmm. here and, and what does it mean and, and being unafraid to ask questions and being unafraid of the answers. Yeah. Thank you. What a beautiful beautiful, perfect response, honestly. Oh my goodness, oh thank, my you. God. Oh. <laughs> really. thank you. Thank you. So, I agree, of course, and I also think that, um, you know, the trajectory that this country is on, um, of course we are a capitalist society, but the trajectory that our form of capitalism is seems to be taking, I call it I, me, mine capitalism which is where you don't care about the other stakeholders and where it's all about putting yourself first and everybody else a very, very, very far second. And you know, when it's customers, when it's affecting people in nursing homes, private equity owned nursing homes experience, residents experience 10% greater mortality rates it's because of those efficiencies that they're so good at. They don't want to hire enough people to take care of the residents of the nursing home. So when you start to see these kinds of figures, we now have 30 plus years of really good, robust academic studies that tell us what happens when some of these um, predatory tactics take over. And so, um, you know, are we going in a direction where the stakeholders, the, the vast array of stakeholders get less and less and less, and this very small, narrow slice of the pie gets more and more. I don't think that's what we want, and so that's why I'm trying to shed light on it. Yeah, I'm glad you are. Andrew? Uh, thank you, Gretchen. I was gonna ask you that question. I think you, um, in what sense is this an American phenomenon? Because I was thinking, um, it's a great question. I just was in um, in Italy with some Russian and Ukrainian journalists, and this question actually came up um, about money and what is money. And I started thinking about it uh, because in Russian and, and in Ukrainian, it's it's a plural, and we think of money. And in German, I was thinking about the Morgenthaus. Actually, <laughs> they're not on my brain all the time. Um, <laughs> But that, you know, money is out here, money is an object. And these uh, journalists, young journalists, were talking, you know, many now who have no money, and the conversation was, how do we as independent journalists maintain um, what we do when they need very little money? And I'm trying to help fundraise for that. So anyone in private equity. Um, <laughs> so I, I, don't, I do think it's a specifically American thing. Um, the, the sense that we have, the relationship we have uh, with money. And the conversation went something like this in two sentences. Money is a, uh, has an energy. Money is something you need to respect. Mm -hmm. And that's not the household I grew up in. Um, it is the household, I think, that many of the generations of the Morgenthau family did grow up in mm -hmm. um, because of that really strange rags to riches to rags. Um, uh, sign curve, that Lazarus Morgenthau, the patriarch, that's kind of the original sin that they grew out of. Uh, there, uh, the DA didn't, uh, it was a non-unauthorized biography. He never threw any roadblocks in my way. The only time he kind of uh, bridled was when I asked about money. Yeah. Um, various <laughs> estates. Is it because it's rude? Partly because it's rude, you don't ask, um, but partly because, as he would say, people always think we're so goddamn rich. He was a sailor, and so he was salty, as many of you know. Um, people think we're so rich. We're not the bankers. We're not the Goldmans and the Saxes and the Strausses and the Seligmans. I could go on. Um, you know, uh, and moreover, Henry Morgenthau Sr., as I said, telegraphically, built something. Yeah, he, real estate, um, at a time when it was of great risk, and he left that legacy. He also made a few million, um, certainly by the 1920s, um, and on the Lehman side, well, you know that story. Um, 
But throughout the generation, these trusts were what he did say. We couldn't touch it. We couldn't draw it on it. And it was actually a source of, uh, of consternation, if not anger. You couldn't draw it down on it. And um, it was leaving, setting aside a legacy for care. Um, and in fact, when he first talked about money, this is the DA, he had seven children. Um, and the very first time we met, the very first interview, he told, told me about his daughter um, who had been born um, uh, severely disabled and had never recognized him, even though he saw her each year um, in a facility upstate in New York. And I had just read this profile of Arthur Miller and when he had renounced um, his son. It wasn't about money, but he was concerned that there'd be enough money for her. Um, and money as kind of you're the steward, respect and, and understand the energy of money. I think anyone who ever worked closely with Robert Morgenthau would say, the man knew law and order, but he knew money and how money worked yeah. above all. Yeah. And, uh, and that's certainly one of the threads in the book in the DA's years. And the reason why it wasn't just Bloomberg or BCCI, he would always follow the money. Uh, and he would always understand how money worked. And I asked him, to your question, why didn't you go into Wall Street? And many, many times he was offered to join Goldman Sachs, Little Brothers, many banks wanted him. And he would kind of shrug his shoulders. He wasn't, he had enough. Mm -hmm. And he had, and he would say New York's an expensive city. Mm -hmm. um, so. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, we, it's time for, for, for your questions. Um, we've got one here. Is it, are these on? Why don't you come up here and ask the question? Yeah. You mentioned that the uh, private Start equity... at the beginning. Private equity people are now in charge yeah. of the economy. And we have a person here on the island who's been described by New Yorker magazine as a vulture capitalist. Mm -hmm. And in recent news, it's been reported that he's been paying for uh, trips for Judge Alito. Um, so my question is... Uh, he's now he's now getting in control of at least somebody on the Supreme Court, or at least having some great great influence. Um, so my question is: Given this trajectory, um, two things: How do we reverse this trajectory? It, it's not just the economy now; it's like antitrust cases aren't going to work anymore right now, anyway. Um, how do we reverse the trajectory? And are are there any examples of people in that position, the, the uh, private equity position, where they've changed their mind and seen the light and somehow changed their way of uh, thinking about these things? So for the panel. Okay, I always um, hesitate to use vulture capitalists because I think it gives vultures a bad name. <laughs> I mean, vultures do what vultures do, but uh, these guys do not have to do what they do, okay? So anyway, not, not just to say that about vulture capitalism. So what do you do about it? I mean, is there anything any average real people can do? Very difficult. First of all, you have a lot of money in Congress from private equity forces that are manipulating outcomes. Um, the, the One of the key reasons these people are multi-multi-billionaires is because of a tax loophole that they um, end up paying far less on their taxes <laughs> than um, a bus driver or a school teacher would. So last year or the year before when that tax loophole came up for a possible fix to try to eliminate it, um, Kirsten Sinema uh, from Arizona was given I think three million dollars by private equity entities and she voted against it and basically killed it. So we're always gonna have to deal with people who are bought and paid for 
Um, I don't know how you get rid of that. That's the whole problem of dark money in our system, and that's unfortunately something we have to live with. I would love to be able to say don't shop at private equity entities, but you don't even know who they are and where they are. And when you're going to the emergency department of a hospital, you can't say, hey, by the way, are you owned by private equity? Because then I want to go somewhere else. Um, and nursing homes, but you can try to find out if there are, if there is an ownership. If a, a nursing home is owned by private equity, do not send a loved one there. It's just absolutely imperative. Um, very, very difficult. I think what I tried to do with this book is educate people, let them know this is happening, and just educating is the important thing. I really do not see a quick and easy fix for it. But I do think the more people know, the better off we'll be. Question here. Thank you, panel. Very insightful. But I want to look towards the future a little bit and uh, ask a question about something that has worked its way into the investment field, and that is the criteria of environmental, social, and governance uh, criteria that's that is being overlaid on investing now. And it's taken a big movement within corporate America and within the investing area. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, many, uh, many analytic areas are looking at this as an important way to evaluate your investment. Of course, this has been disparaged by many in the uh, far right or even right, but it's actually a very real way of incorporating issues around the environment, around uh, social issues and, and governance into corporate life. I wonder if you think this is true? Is it a roost? Is it a smokescreen? Or is it really a move towards democratization of, of investing? Um, I think that it's uh, an ideal, and I think that as with any ideals and any kind of um, investing strategy, that there are good actors and bad actors. There are always going to be people who claim to be doing something that they're not doing. ESG is a perfect example of that. I prefer to look at it as, is the business model sustainable? Is this a sustainable thing? I mean, so let's not put a label on it that just talks about the environment or about wokeism or about social justice. Let's see if this is sustainable. And I think that is really the key measure here. And <clears throat> sometimes hard to do that, but I do believe that that's what those entities are trying to get at. But you do have to be careful. Some of them are pretending they are wearing the cloak and they really are not acting um, in that appropriate manner. Please join me in thanking our panel and our moderator, John, Andrew, Gretchen, and Jeanette. Um, just to remind you, the authors will be signing um, their books at the signing tent for the next half an hour. Books are for sale in the, in the book sales tent. Um, we hope that you'll stay with us for presidential politics, the battle for the future, and reflections on the past. <laughs>